Good evening, everyone. My name is Sylvia Rochello, and I am one of the curators of the New School Art Collection. Welcome to this evening's program. We are really, really pleased to host a presentation of The Measures by artists Jacqueline Goss and Jenny Perlin. Uh, the Measures is being presented in conjunction with the exhibition Archive Bound, which is now at the Center of Bo for Book Arts, curated by art historian, educator, and independent curator Karen Jones. Um, in Archive Bound, uh, Karen has assembled really an incredible and important group of works from conceptual, performance, and site-specific art practices. Um, and in the exhibition, she addresses and critically presents um, uh, these non-object-based works in, in, and how they are presented in an exhibition setting, a traditional exhibition setting. I really urge you to go see it um, the, before it closes on December 12th. Center for Book Arts is on 27th Street, and it's open late tomorrow night, so you have a chance to go uh, after dinner tomorrow. Um, our thanks. Sincere thanks uh, to Karen Jones for bringing this program and a brilliant interview just a few weeks ago with one of the Gorilla Girls, Frida Kahlo. Um, she brought that interview to the New School as part of the programming of, this, uh, of, of her exhibition. Um, you can watch that interview on the New School YouTube channel. So just Google archive bound Frida Kahlo New School and you'll be able to see it. I highly recommend it. Um, our thanks also to the executive director and curator of Center for Book Arts, Alex Campos, uh, for partnering with us. Uh, the Center for Book Arts, as some of you may know, is a rare jewel. It is a nonprofit or arts organization dedicated to exploring the art of the book within the larger context of contemporary art and um, society. And sorry, uh, but on I have to s say some Thank you, Boilerplate, on behalf of Alex Campos and Center uh, for Book Arts. This uh, support for Archive Bound is provided in part by the New York State Council of the Arts with the support of Andrew Cuomo and New York State Legislature funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, lastly, uh, Thanks to Pam Tillis, who could not jump, be here tonight. She is our director of public programs at the New School. She and her team really made this program possible. Um, before Karen comes to the podium and to speak a little bit about her exhibition and to introduce uh, Jackie and Jenny, um, she's asked me to give you a brief overview of one of our rare jewels, um, and you're sitting inside it, um, the Orozco Mural Cycle, one of the first and most important and historic commissions um, that are part of what is now the New School Art Collection. So um, I'm going to step away from the mic. I'm going to ask you guys to all get up and join me outside where the Mural Cycle really is introduced. Just give you sort of a brief overview of the history of this of this commission. Um, you're actually standing in the footprint of the landmark building um, that was designed by Joseph Urban, a uh, Viennese uh, secessionist architect in 1930. When the new school um, began, began in 1919, um, its, first, um, it, its first building was uh, actually housed on 23rd Street near, near London Terrace. As the school got larger, the first director, Alvin Johnson, um, wanted to build a, a building that really, really reflected the innovative, experimental, and progressive ethos of, of the school, which was really a school for um, educating the educated. It was a continuing education. It was 1930s, the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, he hires, he had two architects that he considered, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Joseph Urban. 
he thought he would have a sort of a better um, collaborative uh, dialogue with Joseph Urban. Um, Joseph Urban was really sort of a jack of all trades, a kind of a Renaissance man, a designer, uh, an illustrator. He, he designed sets for um, uh, Ziegfeld Follies, um, designed furniture. Um, but this was one of um, the first buildings. Um, you will know Hearst. Tower where the Norman Foster Building is in Midtown. That that outside is landmarked. That is that is Joseph Urban, um, but he comes here and and uh, builds and designs what uh, is considered one of the first modernist buildings in the United States here at the New School. The and um, and presages really international style. Um, so a very, very important building. Within the building, um, Alvin Johnson um, really, and, and Joseph Urban, uh, what was important is that, arts, that, that, that art would be embedded in the building itself to really inform this incredible educational institution that really was about the, the confluence of, of the arts and social sciences coming together. So, in 1930, the beginnings again of the Great Depression, the school didn't have that much money. Um, Alvin Johnson manages to get three artists to create site specific commissions within the building. Um, Jose Clemente Orozco, one of the big three of the Mexican muralists, with Diego Rivera and, and Siqueiros, one of the most important Mexican muralists, who is here in the United States. Um, then uh, Thomas Hart Benton works on the murals in the boardroom. They are now at the Met. They were tempera on canvas. So there's that famous quote of Thomas Hart Benton where he goes to um, Alvin Johnson and says, you give me the eggs and I'll give you the painting. Um, he worked on egg tempera. And Camilo Egas, an Ecuadorian artist who was commissioned in 1932 to create a painting outside of the Martha Graham dance studio that, was, that is downstairs. Um, so those three artists, uh, those are the three important early commissions which really in many ways have informed the New School Art Collection um, as it sort of began in the 1960s and as it's grown to 2,000 works. We now have 11 site-specific commissions. Um, here, the newest um, in the new university center, Glenn Ligon, Rita McBride, and Alfredo Jar. So I invite you to go visit the center and take a look at the, the new works there. But really, this um, space, this is really in many ways the heart and soul of the institution as, as far as early um, artistic experimentation and practices, and um, it's, it's really, um, uh, uh, celebration of the arts um, commingling with um, all the social sciences in, in an educational sort of modernist hothouse experiment. We're standing here um, in front of what was then the faculty lounge. Behind you would have been, this wall would have been completely open. Um, there was a double staircase with an incredible uh, library with Art Deco stairs. A gallery, when the, when the uh, building opened in 1930, Catherine Dreyer from Societe Anonyme, who worked with Man Ray and Marcel Duchamp, um, who was a curator and artist, curated the first exhibition with contemporary furniture and painting around these galleys, um, uh, the galleries. Um, Orozco does three commissions in the United States. One at Pomona College in the 19, late 1920s. Then he comes here to the New School in 1930-31 and um, does this commission, uh, which is a call to revolution and table of universal brotherhood. And then he goes to Dartmouth and does the, his American Civilization murals in the Baker Library, which are now a landmark, a national landmark. For Orozco, this was really an, an important commission. By the way, it is the only Mexican fresco cycle left in New York City. The only other example is at the Museum of Modern Art, his dive bomber and tank. So it really is, in many ways, a very, very a precious object, not only to the new school, but to the greater community and beyond. Um, he is very clear and knows who his audience is. All three commissions were done in educational institutions. 
By the way, all three artists, were, as I said, we're not, I think I said it, we're not paid for, um, for their commissions. They were just given, uh, they were covered for the cost of the mater their materials. Um, three things going on for Orozco here in New York. He is coming to New York to make his way into the international art scene. He and his compatriots, Diego Rivera was here as well, working on a one-man show at the then Young uh, Museum of Modern Art. It was the second show that the Museum of Modern Art gave to a single artist. The first was Matisse. Siqueiros comes here to also, the revolution you know, work had dried up, so they're here. Um, the commission uh, had challenges. He um, is in a private institution, um, educational institution, which was a first um, in, in many ways. Um, he also is dealing with his first modern piece of architecture. You know, the, if you look at the Joseph Urban, it's the, you know, compressed horizontality. Um, there's no sort of embellishment or decor decorative elements. You're dealing with very, very reduced and very um, uh, functional spaces. For Urban, it was about functionality really dictating the aesthetics. So he's dealing with um, the modernist architecture. He's also dealing with, you know, it's his personal gambit to, in New York and, and coming to a place that he had a very sort of um, uh, kind of love-hate relationship. You know, New York is, you know, is rising. It's becoming uh, vertical. The Empire State Building was just being finished. You know, subways, uh, it's, it is center of industrialization and consumerism. And this, um, and here he is in an educational institution trying to deal with issues of the day. These are the most contemporary and topical murals he ever did. Science, labor, and art introduced the mural cycle. Um, we have a scientist, uh, a labor, and artist basically on an equal plane. C the artist wielding a rainbow, the laborer um, in his, with his anvil and, um, and hammer, and the artist with his protractor and, and, um, and instruments. Uh, did, I, did I just say the artist? Scientist. Um, uh, all three coming together um, in a sort of, in creative and, and effort. Um, it is a wonderful metaphor for the new school. Again, the sciences, science, labor, and art coming together um, in a school that really was about social reform and artistic freedom of expression, really rooted in, in, in those really, um, in that, uh, in those ethos. So um, he introduces the mural cycle in this, what was then the faculty lounge. So let's, why don't we walk in and take a look and I'll give you sort of the, um, the sort of nickel tour of the room before um, Jackie and Jenny begin. Yeah, and please get up close and personal and, and, and take a look because it's a really rare event to sort of get close to these murals. I mean, clearly, um, we ask everyone to help us preserve them by not touching. And as resilient as they are, they're you know, almost uh, over 80 years old, they're also incredibly delicate. Um, he had 47 days to, everyone knows what fresco painting is, right? You know, putting pigment onto fresh plaster, wet plaster, so um, you have to really work fast. Uh, and um, you have to, you know, lay down the colors and, 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 and do the drawing and painting very quickly so that it dries evenly. Um, as I said, he had 47 days to work. The building was still settling. There are sort of inherent age cracks these, that we gave Botox treatments to a few years ago, but they're in very, very good state. Um, he had one lone assistant, Lois Wilcox, a young art student, to help him lay down the plaster. She'd come in very, very early, and he'd get to work. Um, for Orozco, uh, the narrative was never, he was never a linear, he never, you know, he was a very, uh, he wasn't interested in telling you the whole story. For him, painting was like poetry in many ways. Um, you needed to sort of uh, 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 resolve it in your own way or, 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 or um, 
extract your uh, meaning from it. He wasn't going to tell you, sort of give you the, the full sort of story and lay it out for you simply. But he does sort of lay these panels out in a north-south um, are allegorical and east-west are sociopolitical. As I said, these were the most topical murals. So we're dealing with um, revolutions that are being wrought at that moment in time at the peripheries, really, of the European center. So we've got this panel called Struggle of uh, the, uh, the Orient uh, with Gandhi um, and, um, and various, uh, various forms of slavery and uh, in English imperialism. Um, these white collar, collared manacled workers. This was at the moment when Gandhi had just done his famous salt march, 400 kilometer march, um, protesting the imposition of the British salt tax. Um, he's is sort of in a uh, you know raised. There's there are a lot of dualities in these in these murals. You know the the hero, the masses, the public, the private, the intellectual, the uneducated. All of these kinds of um, of, of, of uh, things going on. Um, behind Gandhi is a woman named Sarojuni Naidu. She was a freedom fighter. She walked with Gandhi um, at that 400 kilometer march, but she was also part of the Delphic Circle. That's the other element that sort of played into um, this commission. Orozco is is welcomed by a group, an intellectual salon that was run by his dealer, Alma Reed, who was a journalist. Um, she had strong ties to Mexico, and she gets Orozco this commission here at the New School. Um, it was an intellectual salon that was kind of a utopian salon that believed in, um, that really strove for, um, um, uh, believed in literacy worldwide and humanitarian issues and all sorts of kind of um, bringing um, education to quote unquote the masses. She ran that salon, but there were uh, people who Orozco uh, knew and met through uh, uh, the salon like Sarojuni Naidu. Um, on the other side of um, of the room, we have struggle of the Occident. And here we have um, uh, an agrarian land reformist, Carrillo Puerto. He was um, the governor of the Yucatan. He was, uh, he believed in women's rights to vote. He was very, very progressive, um, progressive uh, governor. Um, he was assassinated in 1924, but um, uh, Orozco places him up here, also partly as an homage to Alma Reed. Alma Reed was to marry him. He had divorced his wife. He was going to uh, <coughs> marry Alma Reed, but he's assassinated. So there's a bit of an homage to Alma here. Um, we have the Pyramid of Chichen Itza, his female legistas underneath, his flags to revolution, and sort of separated by this sunrise. I don't know how many of you have been downstairs in the auditorium, the wonderful theater that is really iconic, Joseph Urban. There's this sunrise proscenium there. Um, I really think after 10 years of looking at these murals that this is um, a nod to the sunrise proscenium downstairs, Urban's proscenium. But dividing Carrillo uh, Puerto is, um, you know, uh, communism, the Red Guard. We have a portrait of Lenin, who at that point was dead, but also of Stalin in the same, um, the same panel, and Stalin with his League of Workers. Um, in the 1950s, during the McCarthy period, this panel was covered by the administration with a yellow curtain. Um, <laughs> there was a huge kind of um, dialogue and discussion. I mean, these, these, these murals have, um, been sort of accepted, unaccepted, the vagaries of administrations, um, you know, policies, politics have certainly affected these murals. And at that time, a yellow curtain was placed to sort of mitigate, um, you know, these, these difficult discussions. It was Alvin Johnson's kind of um, sort of solution. We're not sure how long the yellow curtain was up, um, but we think it could have been up for about 10 years um, during that McCarthy period. So um, north-south, we have, um, as I said, science, labor, and art that introduces the mural cycle. Table of Universal Brotherhood. 
So here's an, a nod a, a little bit to, these are the utopian panels. I mean, the League of Nations had not really worked out, but here is Orozco placing various sort of stereotypes of um, rate men um, from, from various strata and racial stereotypes as well around the world sitting at a table with an open book. Um, we have some very, very specific figures like Lloyd Goodrich, who was a, a curator of the Young Whitney, um, uh, Reuven Rubin, uh, an Israeli artist, um, Paul Richard, a French philosopher. But amongst them were the educated and the, um, the uneducated. He's placing there are laborers and workers up there. Um, Again, you know, this is New York 1930-31, so um, he's placing some of the more marginalized. Um, Eric and I did, my fellow curator Eric Stark and I did a show on Orozco a few years ago where we um, looked at the archive and he, Alma Reed named all the panels, but he places at the head of the table what he called the three marginalized three despised races, the Mexican, the African-American, and, and the Jewish um, artist. Um, Alma calls this table of universal brotherhood, but there was a definite hierarchy there. Um, there, he writes in his notes, I worried that the new school didn't have that much money and the trustees wouldn't um, fund it. So, um, you know, there was that issue. When these murals opened to great fanfare and the building opened and 20,000 people showed up, um, this particular group of murals by Orozco fell to a critical thud. They were really not well received and it wasn't necessarily because of Stalin or Lenin. Um, it was m more about uh, you know, the formal qualities of, of the composition. He was experimenting. He was given sort of free reign by Alvin Johnson, and he was experimenting with a compositional device called dynamic symmetry. Frank Alva Parsons was teaching it. Um, it was the idea of using the golden mean um, uh, in nature to create kind of a dynamism, you know, so you see the repetition. I mean, Rob Storr, um, who is a curator and uh, the dean of uh, Yale Fine Arts, talks about if you want to learn about abstract expressionism, go to the New School and draw Orozco and draw Benton. These guys, um, especially Orozco, very much influenced people like Jackson Pollock, who was Benton's student downstairs and who, um, probably would have seen this. He certainly went to Dartmouth um, and uh, followed Orozco um, and had great affinity with Orozco, Jacob Lawrence. Um, the young abstract expressionists were very, very much influenced by um, uh, Orozco. Um, behind us, uh, what some uh, scholars call um, uh, Orozco's happy panel, um, homecoming of the worker of the new day, we've got um, food and books and a warm fire and a worker coming home from work um, to his home, a very traditional home, of course. Um, but the good things in life being, um, being, um, uh, uh, being drawn, drawn on, this, on this vignette. Um, so the idea, I mean, you know, one can, can talk about sort of these murals in a, in a bit of a thread, the idea that the coming together of uh, education, um, labor, uh, and, and arts uh, would create, um, you know, uh, would create um, sort of uh, the basic uh, human, human, human needs would be fulfilled by, by that, um, that kind of uh, productive engagement. Um, other things that are going on in here, um, we've got tools that he uses. Again, this duality of creation and destruction, tools for creating buildings as well as, you know, for him, uh, New York had its great assets, but also he was looking at an apocalyptic, you know, um, so he had a bit of a, sort of, this is bef clearly between the wars, um, you know, depression, all sorts of um, 
difficult um, things plaguing society. Um, I don't know if there are any different today, but um, certainly um, his vision of, 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 of reality and revolutions, he places these revolutions up on these, uh, these um, panels, asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, are these the answers? Um, is revolution uh, the way to go? Um, he also places an open book, and this kind of dynamic symmetry with this table tilt, twilted, tilted towards you, with sort of um, a kind of an open palette, um, really um, inviting a certain kind of engagement um, to the viewer. I mean, this was very relational for, for Orozco. The murals were the great democratic art form. They were meant to be, uh, there, were, there was meant to be a very specific engagement between uh, the viewer and what was up on these uh, on these murals. Um, so let's see. Uh, if, uh, do, a Q &A? do you want to do a quickie Q and A? Sure, sure. Yes, he did. Um, why? Yes, he did. Absolutely right. He put some sand. He was playing around with some material. It is considered true fresco, but he was playing with uh, sand and mica. So you'll see that. Uh, you see some of that flecking um, uh, is there. Yeah. This was um, during uh, when the um, Thomas Hart Benton murals were sold in the early 80s and were purchased by AXA, um, the insurance company. Um, these murals were restored by Williamstown Conservation Lab. They were restored twice. Thomas Hart Benton had, had actually covered them with sort of shellac to preserve them. Um, this was the dining hall. So there was a lot, you see photographs of the early dining tables with lots of women because um, the primarily people who were coming back to school were many women. You see women smoking at, you know, <laughs> so there was a lot of smoke, a lot of grime, a lot of soot. They were restored twice. Um, but, uh, and they get a checkup once a year by Williamstown. But yes, the flecks are definitely um, part of it. Any other questions? I have one for Roscoe's working method. Did he work on like scaffolding? How did he yeah, he had, a sca he had a scaffold. He actually, um, it was a small, a small scaffold and we have a couple of wonderful photographs of his, his student Lois Wilcox laying down the plaster. Um, you see in some areas the giornate, the day's work, which is in fresco parlance. You know, the Italian, um, you know, finishing uh, off one panel is called the giornata. So you see certain parts where he ended and began. Um, but yes, he worked on a scaffold and he worked very, very quickly. Yeah. How long did it take him to 47 days. Um, yeah, he worked very, very fast. I mean, Thomas Hart Benton took a year to finish his panels in his studio, and they were brought in through the windows. Here it was uh, definitely in, uh, in situ. Was he fed? <laughs> I, I hope he was, I mean, yes. He he seemed, must have been working. Yeah, yeah, no, he worked, he worked pretty fast. And as I said, the building was still settling, so um, there were those issues as well. And in many, as I said, these, these murals are really the heart and soul of, of the New School in many ways. And they have informed our collecting uh, uh, holdings um, and, and really, um, you know, our, our, it, it is a testament in, in many ways. You know, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, um, Diego Rivera had his, his mural at Rockefeller Center um, removed, um, Rockefeller asked him to remove his, the mural, be, remove the portrait of Lenin. Um, it was a public space. I mean, in many ways, these have been protected by the private institution. Um, who knows what would have happened if they had really been public. Um, so, so at that, um, without, uh, without sort of um, any further ado, I'd like to introduce Karen Jones, and Karen will, um, We'll introduce the artists and we will move forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sylvia, for such a very welcome. The measures is really uh, a perfect um, example of the kind of work that is exhibited in the show. This is a film by Jacqueline Goss and Jenny Perlin, which incorporates uh, both performative and conceptual elements in the film medium. 
Likewise, the space uh, is a very site-specific um, installation, and it is a really a perfect and fitting setting for um, the um, presentation of the measures. Jacqueline Goss is an associate professor of film and electronic arts at Bard College. She's a graduate of Brown University in the Modern Culture and Media Studies, and her MFA is from Rensselaer Polytech. Uh, her recent video and film-based works include Stranger, um, Coming to Town, How to Fly in the World, There There Square, and The, tenth, the 100th Undone. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce Jenny Perlin, her co-conspirator. And um, Jenny Perlin um, teaches here at the New School as well as the Cooper Union. She received her BA also from Brown University in Literature and Society, Modern Culture and Media Department. Her MFA is from the School, um, the school of the Institute of Chicago, Art, Art Institute of Chicago uh, in Film. And she attended the, and completed the Whitney Independent Study Program. Uh, Perlin makes films, videos, installations, and drawings. Her projects draw on an interdisciplinary research in history, cultural studies, literature, and linguistics. Uh, she shoots 16 millimeter and digital video and combines live action, stage, and documentary images with hand-drawn text-based animation. Uh, the Measures is um, an, essayist, an essayistic performative performance that considers the travails of two French astronomer mathematicians as they measure the Earth's meridian arc from Dunkirk to Barcelona, and in part to determine the appropriate length of the meter. So with no further ado, I'm going to um, turn the floor over to Jacqueline Goss and Jenny Perlin, and um, they will screen the film with a voiceover delivered by Goss and Perlin. Thank you for coming. They're called savants, those who know. Their experiments unfold before crowds of commoners, clergy, and kings. This is France in the year 1791. There are over 250,000 different units of measure. The savants invent a new simple system when taken from the Earth's constancy and based on the number 10. This will be the meter, a length measuring one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. The Academy appoints two savants to measure the distance from the English Channel to the Mediterranean. Jean-Baptiste de Lombe will measure the north and Pierre Michan will take the south. They will meet at the cathedral in Rodez.
Using two rotating telescopes stacked vertically and mounted on a tripod, each man triangulates his way back to the other. They think it will take a year. It takes seven. This is where Michan starts, Barcelona. This is a city of brightness, a town with harbor and mountain, a place that hides its industry. Michan builds a tower on the fortress of Montjuic to look north and make his first side of a triangle. Michan settles in here for months of stargazing, and these early observations will seal his fate. Here's what he does. Geometry tells him if he knows the actual length of one side of a triangle, and all three of its angles, he can determine the lengths of the other two sides without having to physically measure them. And once he has this triangle measured, he can build another off one of its sides, and another, and another. He calls these telescopes his repeating circles, and he focuses on two points in the distance. He sights point A and then point B. He measures the angle between top and bottom lenses, measures this angle again and again, and then he checks the precision of his work against the stars. In this way, Michan and Delam slowly measure the globe's invisible line. October 1792, Michan's at the top of a mountain in Spain, Montserrat, the serrated mountain. He's drawing imaginary lines from peak to peak with the repeating circles, sleeping comfortably in a bed at night. The French Revolution begins, but he's far away, up high, knowing this is the first of many stations he'll measure, and if it goes this well, he'll surely be home in a year.
Emine, Mesure Officielle, Emine de Dijon, Doxon, de Saint-Jean de Lone, de Sœur, Verdun, Chalin, Chagny, Agilly, Nolay, and more. Measures of grain. They're all different, close, but not the same. Then there are the salt measures, the liquid measures. Mouid, cat, pant, velt, bouteille, poisson, hockey, chevaux, tonneau, and verre. Trade's chaotic. A woman is given an acre of land to sow and harvest. Her acre is larger than her neighbor's because hers is more difficult terrain. A man goes from his town to the next village. He's asked how far he's traveled. He says, it took the better part of a day. March 1793, Michan is almost killed when he takes a day trip with a friend to see the latest technology in Spanish water pumps. A lever from the pump snaps and crushes Michan against a wall. He spends six months recovering in a hotel in Barcelona. Fighting breaks out in the Pyrenees. Spain orders all French to leave the country. Back in Barcelona, Michan writes letter after letter to the powers that be, asking permission to be where he already is. Mizar's the name of the star. It doesn't make sense. It does whatever it wants, however it wants. Michan can't stop calculating. Stuck in the hotel, he measures the latitude of Montjuic again from his roof using six different stars. Five give him near perfect unity. He locates himself on Earth to within a few feet. Then he turns to the sixth, Mizar and this sixth star knocks him off his axis. All his numbers fail. He asks to go back to the fortress to measure again, but permission is denied. To compensate, he makes 10,000 measurements from the roof of his hotel, but the mistake doesn't go away. Everything's thrown off by this one star. Michan's time is up. The clear waters of expertise are poisoned by the star Mizar. Michan stays in the hotel in Barcelona until May, trying to get the numbers right. He can't resolve the difference. In a panic, he leaves for Italy and stays there for a year. Everyone's trying to reach him. He stalls and won't come back. There is a desire to abstract a knowable thing, a human desire to measure, to split evenly into units over and over. Or is it only human, the province of all animals, of all living things, to divide and divide again?
Delambe begins his triangles around Paris, aims his repeating circles at the cross, at the top of the Pantheon, a perfect target, only to find it missing. The sang collates destroying cathedral towers faster than Delambe can locate them. As an experiment, you said we should describe these two men, each as a color. For Michelin, you say blue, leading to dark turquoise. For Delam, the man of action, I pick blue too. Patriotic, vibrant, but sort of fiduciary, like the color of a bank sign. The Meridian Project calls for two physical measurements, two real lines to which all the abstract triangles made from stars, cathedrals, and mountaintops can connect. Delam goes to measure this northern baseline outside of Paris. <coughs> Here in Melun, he lines up platinum rulers, moving one to connect to the end of the other for 41 days, morning to night. Six miles of rulers on a straight Roman road. The ghost of Delam here in the center of a traffic rotary. Under the trees, everything looked right. A revolution means everything turns. It all has to be new. Days, weeks, years, all time. The Basilica of Saint-Denis has been the site of royal coronations and burials for 800 years. During the revolution, all the dead bodies of kings and queens are removed from their crypts and dumped into two pits nearby. Here in Saint-Denis, they seize Delambe and his devices. To defend himself, he unpacks all his tools and demonstrates how they work. 
rotating telescopes, platinum rulers, notebooks. The astronomer defends. Citizens listen skeptically. Citizen, I challenge you to recite the months of the year in the new revolutionary calendar. Vandermeer, Brumaire, Frimaire, Nibos, Pluvios, Vantos, Germinal, Florial, Prairial, Mesador, Thermidor, Fructidor. Accusations, senseless imprisonment, reckless murders. The guillotine slices off a head in under two seconds. The repeating circle was not the only new technology. You need new tools to streamline an otherwise tedious process of mass execution. How do you measure the terror of 1794? A terror whose victims include Scribes, notaries, lawyers, locksmiths, cobblers, coopers, innkeepers, cafe owners, waiters, brewers, vinegar makers, lemonade vendors, bookkeepers, architects, chocolate makers, bakers, pastry makers, doctors, wet nurses, domestic servants, dyers, hosiers, muslin workers, drummers, musicians, actors, wig makers, Habadashers, seamstresses, painters, hairdressers, herbalists, boatmen, printers, math students, coal miners, and fishwives. Mazar is a special kind of star and very famous. It's got a companion, a very faint star named Alcor, not too far away. And these two stars move together Gravity keeps them near, and they rotate around one another. Michel, like all astronomers of the time, knew this. His error lay not in the star, but elsewhere. Michel's in Italy. They write him letters. Come back, finish your work. But he won't. You say his is a response of sanity in the face of death. Delambe is now here at his zenith in Dunkirk, ready to mirror Michen's star measurements. Which stars did you use, he writes to Michen. No answer, but
but a question in return. Sunflower Galaxy, Sombrero Galaxy, Owl Nebula, Cetus A, Little Dumbbell Nebula, Clusters, Objects, Constellations. A world spent looking outward into a secret, silent space. Watching and searching, moving and standing, building and lifting, being high, being cold, being hot, looking through and out of this swirling world. It's June 1794. The terror is over. The damage is done. Bresson wrote, all battles are waged in the creases of the maps. All things have a middle, a gap, a valley, a place where mistakes like to land. The Bourges region, marshy, gray, flat, hard to fathom. We needed to get this project done. It's something we took on together and couldn't even envision going back on, though at times our feet felt mired in mud that was not, in fact, underfoot at all. April 1795. Michan is finally convinced to leave Italy, but he stalls in the south of France for five months. He decides to go to Perpignan to measure the southern baseline. This shouldn't take too long. And he can almost see the top of the cathedral in Rodez, where his triangles will finally converge with Delam's. The hardest part is done, or so it seems.
Dr. Lam is in Rodez. He's measured almost all of Paris on his own, and now he's at this red-rocked cathedral, and it is beautiful. Joyous reunion awaits. The two will come together, victorious in their quest for scientific accuracy. But Michan is nowhere to be found. They send letters back and forth. Michan flatters Delam. Delam coaxes Michan. Spring comes, and Michan procrastinates, remeasures, and builds a sundial near Perpignan. It's been five and a half years since Michan and Delam started measuring, but there's still no meter. January 1798, the Academy calls a conference inviting all the best savants of Europe to Paris. It's a meeting of great minds and they will query each triangle, test each measurement, check Delambe and Michon's data to see if they agree. Together, the savants will calculate, concatenate, and determine the meter's precise length. They will make it real. The meter will make life easier. No more varying of the size of the loaf of bread or jug of wine. The meter, the liter, and the kilo. No trusting of the eye or hand. Price will be the only variable. But first, they need the numbers. And in July of 98, with only three months to go before the conference, the second baseline in Perpignan still needs measuring. And this is Michel's baseline. He thinks of it as his, his one real, true line of a triangle, but he refuses. His wife, whom he hasn't seen in six years, meets with him and begs him to measure it. After their meeting, she writes to Delambe in secret. Outside Perpignan, we find the marker where, alone, Delam starts and finishes. We see the straight road he measures. We shoot it, my skinny tripod shaking, and yours steadfast. And we see these two little streets that run through the fields and stop short before the A1 highway. The streets, right next to each other, are called Impasse de Lombe and Impasse Michonne. Michonne and de Lombe, dead ends. Scale, degree of precision, magnitude of error, uniformity, universality, equality, making all the world familiar, eccentricities absorbed, 
made into surface texture. People fight for years in Somalia, Congo, Kashmir, and other places you will never know or hear about because the news doesn't tell you. You felt as distant from this as from reports of the US Civil War, the Vietnam War, or the war between France and Spain, France and everywhere, everywhere that was threatened by populist uprising in the late 18th century, each battle about the impossibility of sameness. Michan begins to measure north toward Rodez, but gets stuck in the mountains above saint pont a valley that feels like a vortex, a deep thumb press in the middle of the mountains, a town, as you rightly pointed out, where a person can easily disappear. Not that it's not beautiful, it is, but we got there, we ate some food, and didn't know what to do or film. It felt all closed in and kind of pointless. Michan is still measuring here through September as the savants of Europe arrive in Paris. He's stalling, unwilling to relinquish his measurements. Delam makes the three-day journey from Rodez and waits patiently for in the valley for him. It's October, then November. The savants have been in Paris for three months, but Delam will not leave without Michan. But are they still savants? When Delam finally lures Michonne down from the mountains and back to Paris, when they close their triangles and all of France is measured, when it's now January 1799 and the fin de siècle is in full swing, has modernity dawned? Are the savants who await them now scientists?
the scientists of Europe do math. Michan despairs, worried the conflicting data from Barcelona will reveal his failures. Instead, the scientists blame them on an irregularly shaped meridian, a bump on the Earth's surface, someone else's mistake. In June 1799, as the bloody century draws to a close, the scientists melt, mold, cut, and present a platinum bar, a length based on an inconstant Earth, a measure for all humanity. The meter, the liter, the kilo, objects manifest from seven years of measurements by Delam and Michan. Celebrations, revolutions, new regimes. Napoleon grabs power, so much for the people running the show. Now there's an emperor, and he wants it all. Michan and Delam are lauded and rewarded for their work. At the pinnacles of their careers, Michan is declared the head of the observatory, and Delam the president of the academy. In 1803, Michan can't resist and heads south again to measure and calculate new triangles in the islands off Barcelona. He knows it's the end of him. He's old and he wants to die there where the failure is most palpable. And he contracts yellow fever and does so in 1804 in Valencia, Spain. Delam writes Michan into history as a hero he skirts around the mistakes and hides their letters in a box. The base du système métrique décimal ou mesure de l'arc du méridien, comprising the entire parallel of Dunkirk to Barcelona, executed in 1792 and in following years, published in 1806. Even with a small telescope, you can see that Mazar itself is a double star. And these two orbit around one another. And Mazar is found to be a double-double, a group of four. And Alcor is also a double, so there are six. Michan insisted he used only the brightest star of Mazar. Delam didn't use it. The star is not the problem. Each time Michan used the repeating circle, it wore down, just a little bit. A turn, another turn, 10,000 turns. The device itself was altered, just a little bit. When we were kids, we learned about the meter and understood that it would soon become the standard. We were excited and confused and spent a lot of time in school looking at these odd lengths and volumes, translating between our old and new measures. But the change never happened. The globe is as violent and chaotic as it ever was, fragmented, revolutionary, incomprehensible. Moments of clarity glimmer like fish jumping out of the sea, only to disappear again in the water above an old boat's wreckage. A flash of silver, quick ripples, and they're gone. Oh, 
How long did it take the film from conception to the final edit? Um, well, it, it was a, it's a project that I had thought about doing on my own quite a number of years ago, I guess probably about 12 years ago now. And um, really, the, the main text is the first source that we list, uh, the Ken Alder book, was something I had read early on. And I did this whole trip on my own. Um, and over the course of 10 days and shot a bunch of video and I couldn't really figure out how to make something out of it. It just, it, it wasn't alive. And then I realized, you know, finally, it, I realized it's actually a story about collaboration and the difficulties and, you know, what, what kind of comes out of those, those kind of projects. And so um, I guess it was about, now it's been a, probably four years when I, I asked Jenny if she wanted to try to do something with me, and she said, she said, yes, but we have to wait a year because I'm moving to Berlin. So we waited a year, and then she was in Berlin, I was in New York, and we met in Barcelona and did this trip together um, for a week. And then uh, over the ne course of the next year, worked um, back and forth. We also were not, when we, she returned to New York, but I was upstate, so we never really quite lived in the same place at a, any point making the project. But, you know, figured out ways to share files. We wrote very collaboratively for a year. We gave each other challenges for the animations. Um, and yeah, so I'd say all in all, the collaborative part, two, two to three years. And then it's been about a year that we've been doing these various per performance presentations of it as well. Elizabeth. So like two thirds through the film, it started saying like Masham was losing it, like <laughs> maybe mentally ill or something. Like I couldn't figure it out, just didn't want it. So I, I wish, I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit what happened where he would not measure the baseline. He would just occasionally say, I'm done, I don't want to do this, or because he had made a mistake. Did I read that properly? <laughs> um, uh, you know, we are obviously going on a book that's written as a history book, but it's also meant to sell copies. So um, our, you know, our fascination with these characters is that they're, they were so different. And Mashan, um, through the texts that we read and other things that we read about him, um, do clearly show that he uh, was freaking out for various reasons, um, not least of which was the French Revolution. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> So um, while there is a lot of, seems to be a lot of documentation that Misham was extremely meticulous and very, very um, precise and obsessed with being correct and precise in his uh, measurements, um, you know, there is a line in the film about how, you know, perhaps this is the sane response uh, in, in the face of the kind of chaos that's engulfing uh, France at the time. Um, just to just to kind of 
throw his hands up and walk away because it seemed quite hopeless for quite some time. But yeah, it seems like his his complete devotion to getting the most precise measurements he could get actually were his undoing. That he, in effect, used these tools so obsessively. And uh, you know, uh, as the story unfolds, he, he, rec he records all this data in Barcelona and then goes back and hopes to get the exact same measurements and he can't and he freaks, he freaks out and does these 10,000 measurements over and over and over again and can't, re kids can't re recreate that data. Um, and it seems that part, part of the problem was actually that he was turning these telescopes over and over and over and over and over again and kind of wearing them down. So he's almost making it impossible for himself to recreate that data. Um, and just a couple other notes about that. One is um, <coughs> the concept of the savant is really different from the concept of the scientist as it develops after these guys. And so the, the savant is this, uh, the embodiment of knowledge and it all resides in him. Uh, and I think that that's a real difference. Um, and what they did and the data that they produced kind of enabled in the early 19th century for people to get together and say, actually, let's crunch numbers. Let's do averages. Let's figure out like how um, mistakes are part of science and, and not um, have the, the, the one body of the measurer be the kind of standard for all of knowledge. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, does at the end, they talk about the double star. Does that play into the whole Barcelona measurement? I mean, was he sort of up against the wall in terms of that? And, or, or yeah, that it seems like from what we can sort of figure out is that there were, you know, th it was not one star. So at what certain points, they're kind of you know, <laughs> gazing upwards to almost anchor themselves on the Earth, like using this sort of GPS thing. And you know, in fact, um, Delam's like, eh, I'll just use that one star. And, but Michelle, who's the obsessive one, is like, no, but there are two. So I must calculate according to the two. And so I think there's, it seems that that also didn't help, <laughs> that it was you know, causing even more consternation that there were these two. And now, and you know, sort of after their time, now everyone understands it's actually, there's six. <laughs> so you know, the more information you have, the, the harder it gets to kind of pin things down, for sure. I, I just want to ask you guys about the performative aspect of, um, of the film, because for me, this is something unusual to see, and it certainly, from an audience point of view, it, it keeps your attention, and it, it feels quite different than watching just some, something, you know, just the film. So I wanted to ask about the choice of, of doing it this way. Um, I'll, I'll start, and you can <laughs> um, Collaboration is really interesting, and I think that Jackie and I, after being at a distance by making this film for so long, also wanted to kind of find a way to be together more. That's part of uh, performative interest, I think. Um, I had done a, a project a few years ago in which um, I had uh, an actor read a voiceover aloud, but from behind the audience, um, and sort of tricking the audience into thinking, well, it's a voiceover, but it's, it's not. And uh, we had talked about um, bringing ourselves, especially as two female filmmakers, um, paralleling the kind of collaborative work of the two male astronomers, um, bringing our voices into it uh, and wanting to um, perhaps change it up from a, what might be a flattening of effect of a, of a traditional voiceover attached to the film, although we do have a version like that. Uh, so the performative aspect was sort of came out of that to some extent. Yeah, and I think, you know, both Jenny and I really enjoyed, do you, you know, we had so many iterations of the text, you know, and actually that for me has been one of the most fun part of collaborating is, you know, there's still lines in here that I think I wrote, <laughs> but I, I honestly, it, this document, it's, I, it's really deeply collaborative to the point where I can't quite remember what Jenny wrote and what I wrote. And there were also many iterations of the voiceover that we were passing back and forth, and we both really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed recording voice, and so at some point we're like, we should just we should just do this live and see what that's like. So, 
um, yeah, it sort of seems to have, it wasn't really anything we set out to do purposefully, but it sort of became part of it, for sure. Okay. <coughs> um, a question about <laughs> the, uh, what you're speaking about, Michonne's um, obsessive uh, obsession with accuracy, I guess, and it's very interesting in relation to what you're talking about, this shift between the notion of the savant and what we now think of as science, I guess, and the, a, as a kind of communal um, checking of data against, uh, so that everybody in the scientific community checks the accuracy. And I'm just wondering, um, and as you were saying, that that was part of his, not downfall, but um, causing him, in, in a sense, I guess he didn't know that his obsession with accuracy was actually making it less accurate, <laughs> in a sense. So I'm wondering about the, sort of the notion of uh, approximation and um, how much we, we sometimes forget that that's always part of all measurement, actually, because right. there's no real way. And whether that has anything, whether his obsession and the whole kind of, I don't know what the right word is, zeitgeist or thinking at the time is related to the notion of absolutes or even um, Christianity or, or the relationship to you know the older way of thinking of the world that it was all made by God, that quote that you have that it's all God's work so it must be measurable and perfect in that way and whether that, that was part of the, this transition from the enlightenment into the modern era. <laughs> Long question. Sorry. Yeah, no, question. I think that's a, that's exactly that's exactly what's happening at that moment is that sort of shifting of, as Jenny said, the notion of the savant. The savant would know, you know, everything might know everything about botany and astronomy and all of you know God's creation. And it wasn't. I don't think it was quite so delineated, like, in, you know, in terms of thinking about one's discipline. Um, and then the other thing that I think was really interesting that is also in this Alder book is um, the difference between accuracy and precision. Like you can be very precise and be completely inaccurate. And I don't think that that's sort of something that this data set that they uncovered actually helped people figure out. Because they were meticulous about keeping track of, you know, that, that um, database kind of descended um, and it exists, you know, I think actually like Frederick Gauss is someone who picked up their database and sort of figured out something about averages and it actually became a really important resource for some of that more contemporary thinking about science. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Um, <laughs> I was really intrigued by the filmmaking process um, and I wondered if you could talk about what ideas you came to it with going to Barcelona and how it changed in collaboration, both of you setting up your cameras and so on. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we decided to shoot 60 millimeter film on these wind up Bolex cameras. So um, we knew that in some ways that technology would mimic the technologies they were using of these tripod, uh, the telescopes on the tripods. And then we also knew we were gonna, the only thing we knew for sure we we're gonna try to do was to set up these diptychs um, and kind of gave ourselves the challenge of finding really, you know, the kind of landscapes that would give, a, a give us away as um, imperfect imagers, <laughs> image makers. So, you know, the first shot of, you know, the seascape in Barcelona, you know, there's n we knew there's no way we'd get those to line up perfectly. And you know, sure enough, we did our best to line them up, but it was two different cameras, um, two different viewfinders. Jenny's camera rolled out before mine. My lenses are all really dirty. Yeah, the lenses. So you know, we kind of knew we were building imperfection and mistake into the process, um, and we knew that would come out for sure in these diptychs. And sure enough, <laughs> they really did. <laughs> um, and then, other than that, you know, we. Um, yeah, we just tried to wherever we we went to you know certain places obviously with that they had been and tried to document some of the places they used um, to make these triangles um, and then you know after that you know the animation that sort of came later and I think Jenny and I both have done a lot of animation and at least for me I, I think of it more akin to writing actually and I think maybe that sort of comes through in the way the animations are used in piece and uh, another thing that. Um, came out in the making was, you know, we had this idea that like, oh, okay, it's gonna be diptychs like all the time, all the time, and maybe it'll be an installation. And then, um, and then 
Um, while Jackie was editing the piece, um, the uh, notion of um, really accentuating the aspect ratio of 16 by 9, 4 by 3 for 16 millimeter, and the diptychs, and uh, you sort of really playing with um, uh, standards, right? This, the, these useless standards that we have that keep changing, um, and how that also connects to, you know, Delam and Michan's like failed task of creating a standard for all of humanity that the U.S. won't adopt. Um, so, so that was also a really wonderful kind of um, thinking through standardization further uh, as the piece progressed. Hey, um, so at one point you guys um, chose to identify a color for each of the astronomers. And I was wondering if throughout the process you found yourself identifying <laughs> with um, or aligning your personalities with the personalities of the astronomers at all. Oh, it's yeah. your guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when we first started talking after, you know, we read this, the one book that really is so much about the two of them and, you know, I read it before Jenny, and then Jenny read it, and the first thing she said, she says, I'm Michelle. And I was like, I want to be Michelle. He's the interesting one. So, you know, we had this little tussle about that. I'm like, oh, you know, you're kind of right. I'm kind of, I kind of don't So there definitely was a, a kind of a lining of that. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because everything, would, once we sort of made that decision, it helped us figure out so many formal things about, um, how to deal with these images and you know even even in the animation you know I'm left-handed and Jenny's right-handed and so it everything would start to kind of push in those ways along those axes um, so it really helped us just as a, a kind of constraint to to kind of think about pushing things in that way and sure. I will say that um, I wanted to be Michelle even before I read the book like when I saw his <laughs> name I was like Bad French, high school French, like Michel. Doesn't that mean like bad? Like what is that Michel? Like what is? And I want to be the bad. <laughs> and I really wanted to be the bad guy. So thank you, Jackie. Thank you, bad guy. He's not the bad guy. I think he's he's the crazy guy. guy. <laughs> he's the better writer. Just like Jenny. Jenny's the he's better. He's so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Had enough. Um, when, once you had uh, kind of struggled with that, or you had aligned with Michonne, did did you um, did you actually stick to that identity through the film or through the whole process, or did it kind of get mixed? I don't think it was there so much when we were shooting. In fact, I remember I, I was telling a student about the project, and he said, "Oh, well, did you shoot a meter apart from each other?" But <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. So no, we it wasn't nearly that. You know, mm. we should have, you know, maybe in the, in the remake. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> that we were both kind of pulling each other up mountains at certain points in the film, and happily we kind of alternated in that yeah, process. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Karen.